Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's another Sunday, it's 10 o'clock, and um, we're all set, uh, especially with our speaker who has been online with us, waiting to get to um, 10 o'clock to start the lecture. In accordance with our rules, although we have made significant progress with uh, technology, uh, please ensure that you are muted. We have tried um, all that we can, and so far, so good is working. And the only reason is that uh, for all, everybody to hear clearly uh, what our guest lecturer has to say to us today. Um, either using the Q&A or finding another way to get your questions to us, at the end of the lecture, we shall take questions and answers and pass them to uh, Sheikh Imam uh, Dr. Bashir to answer for us. Um, without further ado, let me introduce him again uh, in um, as briefly as I can because he's a, he's, a, he's a large man. And if we spend all the time introducing him, we'll have very limited time listening to him. Uh, primarily, is the Imam of Al Furkan Mosque in Kano. Uh, that's big. He's a deputy uh, chair of Freeze at the Central Bank. That is also big. And he continues to, um, as a scholar, teach at the Bayero University. Uh, in Kanu. So without, without listing more, which he definitely has, may I hand over the platform to our speaker, Sheikh Imam, Dr. Bashir Aliu Umar. Uh, I want to apologize to him that we made a typo on the Aliu in his name in the circular that we sent around. It had gone round to everybody before we realized the mistake. His um, middle name is Aliyu, A-L-I-Y-U, not I-U, uh, as was uh, spelled. Um, we hope that he forgives us. May Allah forgive all of us. Um, Imam, the platform is yours. Morhaba bikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati amalina Man yahdihi lahu falamudhilla lah wa man yudhlil falahadiya lah Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna sayyidana wa nabiyana muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. The convener of the Fola Adiola Ramadan lecture series, my esteemed brother, Alaji Fola Adiola, the participants that, have attend, that are attending this lecture series. Uh, I give you the greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I start by thanking Allah tabarak wa ta'ala for making us witness another month of Ramadan. This is indeed a great favor. Quite a number of people, loved ones, known ones who were with us during the Ramadan of last year, uh, no longer with us. We only hope to meet together in Darus Salaam, the abode of peace, inshallah. Uh, secondly, I wish to, I will also uh, express, uh, I will also declare my thanks to Allah wa ta'ala for making it possible for us uh, through using our able brother, 
Alajifola Adiola to convene these lecture series, which has made it possible for us, despite the, uh, the differences of time and space, to come together in the same room and uh, participate in an activity that we pray will strengthen our Iman. These lecture series uh, are indeed uh, a very good initiative uh, that bring uh, that will bring us closer together and closer to Allah Taala in the month of excellence, the month of blessing. It wouldn't have been possible <clears throat> without the favor of Allah by bestowing upon us the uh, power of technique, the power of technology, which has made it possible for us to come together in a virtual setting and benefit from one another. So all thanks are due to Allah Taala, who is the one who shows us and brings down blessings, including the blessings of what the intellect can, uh, of what the intellect can innovate as this one. Uh, and also in the spirit of whoever does not thank people, does not, is not thankful to Allah, I wish to express my thanks and appreciation to Alajifola Adiola for the initiative and also for inviting me to speak. And uh, I pray that this will be in the scales of his good deeds. He and all those who are in this together help uh, giving him uh, all the help. Uh, the, the topic for this, uh, for, for, for this discourse is civic responsibility and in an Islamic paradigm. Uh, the importance of this topic is that we are at a, at a very significant milestone in the, in the history of our country, Nigeria, because of what is, uh, we just came out of a national election and we are facing the transfer of power from one civil authority to another civilian authority. Uh, and we as Muslims being conscious of the fact that our religion is a complete way of life, it makes it imperative for us to derive guidance from the teachings of Islam regarding this important milestone in the life of our nation. Uh, Islam, as we all know, is uh, as, as we as I mentioned, is a complete way of life. Uh, nothing has been left out from the book, as Allah Taala has said, "Ma farrakna fil kitabi min shay." We have not left out anything from the book. And uh, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to be told by the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, in appreciation of what the what they have witnessed from with the companions that your prophet has indeed taught you everything including toilet right from toilet manners so it is not surprising uh, and we this is also something for which we give thanks to allah because that is the perfection of the favors of allah upon us we uh, also another important principle is the suitability of our religion, the religion of Islam, to <clears throat> uh, for every time, place, and situation. And here, the uh, famous Islamic scholars, <clears throat> the out outstanding Islamic scholars, have written extensively on different situations involving the lives of Muslims, uh, including a situation where they will live under an empire or they will live uh, even in remote areas. In fact, they have fathomed a situation whereby Muslims are in a situation whereby the principles of the Sharia are no longer available to them. There is nothing of the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, and there are no scholars to guide them. What happens in such a situation? And uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, one of the outstanding scholars of Islam, uh, Imam al-Haramain, 
the Imam of the two harams, as he is widely known, a very uh, renowned uh, jurist of the Shafi'i Madhab. He wrote his book, Ghiyathil Umam Fil Tiyathil Zulam, that is given succor, given help to, uh, uh, to the nations in the event of uh, darknesses uh, en uh, engulfing the nations. And he concluded his book with this situation whereby Muslims will be in a situation whereby there is even no knowledge of the religion. And he gave guidance and he, he, he mentioned what previous scholars before him have said. So <clears throat> going now to the, uh, the talk, the discourse, uh, responsibility, as we know, is a uh, responsibility is the uh, the state of being accountable or answerable. But uh, the Nadratun Naim, which is uh, an encyclopedia of uh, that was assembled under the leadership of the Imam of uh, of of Haram of Mecca, uh, Sheikh Saleh, Dr. Saleh Ibn Humaid. Uh, this is a compendium of uh, good and uh, good characters for a Muslim to adopt and bad characters for a Muslim to avoid. One of the principal uh, characters that he mentioned is al masuliya that is responsibility, which is, uh, this was done by an assembly of scholars as it is always the task when compiling encyclopedia. And they said that uh, uh, responsibility is the state of being charged to undertake a number of things and offer an account of what was assigned to you. So there is what you are charged to do, and then there is also accountability. And uh, this is the basis behind the uh, behind our creation. Now, when you when responsibility is attached to civility, to civic life, it means the responsibility of the individual towards the society. And uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is something which is central in the religion of Islam. Because in Islam, uh, there is the full realization that a human being, he will only exist he exists in a community, not in isolation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has clearly stated that the Muslim believer who stays, who lives in a community and are doing the uh, undertaking, observing the, uh, the obligations upon him, on the uh, the obligations his obligations on the community the obligations of the community upon him and being and uh, also being patient over what happens to him from other members of the community is more beloved in the sight of Allah than the one who isolates himself fearing that uh, uh, go, uh, uh, going into uh, association with people, is going to negatively affect his religion. And uh, uh, this is one of the, this has been identified as one of the factors that strengthens a Muslim believer, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al Mu'minul Qawi Khairun wa Ahabu illallahi min al Mu'min al Da'if. The strong believer is uh, better and uh, more beloved in the sight of Allah than the weak believer. So because we live in a society, uh, there are obligations and rights of the society upon us, and there are our rights and obligations upon the society. So this is uh, because of this approach and this realization of the position of a Muslim individual in a society, we have clear directions and clear instructions and clear lessons from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that are supposed to guide our, ex our communal existence, our societal existence, and our civic participation in whatever society we find ourselves uh, without, uh, 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 in, in, without any regards to time, place, or situation. 
now responsibility uh responsibility is categorized into uh uh the 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 parties to which you the, to which the individual is responsible to but broadly you can categorize these responsibilities to responsibility to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam responsibility to yourself responsibility to your family and then responsibility to the society uh, responsibility to Allah towards Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is the basis and is the raison d'etre for our existence for our creation we were created as human beings in order to assume responsibility towards Allah. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal fa abayna an yahmilnaha wa ashfaqna minha wa hamalaha al-insan inna hu kana zaluman jahula. We have presented the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to take the, the trust and they were afraid of taking the trust. But mankind, he took up the trust upon himself, but he is indeed uh, a transgressor against himself and an ignorant person uh, regarding what is beneficial to him. So this is the basis of our responsibility to Allah, that Allah created us in order to give us a trust which he, which we are, for which we are going to be held accountable. So the trust is what we are charged with. And the accountability is that, uh, how have we discharged that trust? How have we discharged that trust? And it is by virtue of the trust that he empowered us in the universe. He empowered us in the universe with the senses that he gave us, the senses of sight, hearing, speech, intellect and other senses that have placed us above all his creations above all his creations as allah has said walaqad karamna bani adam wa hamalnahum fil barri wal bahr wa razaqnahum min at tayyibat wa faddalnahum ala kathirin mimman khalaqna tafdila we have indeed honored the sons of adam and we have carried them on land and in sea and we have uh, enriched them with good things and we have preferred them above so many of what we have created with, a, with clear favors. And he subjugated to us all that is in the heavens and earth. Alam taro anna Allah sakhara lakum ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard wa asbaga alaykum ni'amahu zahiratan wa batina. Have you not seen that Allah has subjugated for your benefit all that is in the heavens and the earth? And he has completed and he has uh, he has perfected his favors upon you. So all these is because he has given us the trust and we are responsible for, uh, uh, for fulfilling that trust, which is the declaration of the unity of Allah wa ta'ala and belief in his messengers, which he has promised to send to us over and over a time and uh, time and time again uh, with the last messenger being the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, this is the enormous trust, and this is the biggest of all responsibilities. And without it, no other responsibility will become meaningful. It is the responsibility for which we feel that we, uh, for which there is no policeman that is going to check our devotion and our uh, upholding and our walking with that, uh, uh, with what we are charged with, but we are supposed to be, uh, we are supposed to be the ones to police ourselves, to police our hearts, and uh, the, the 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 this is the essence of belief in the day of reckoning, that we are going to stand up in front of Allah Taala, and Allah is going to ask, is going to uh, uh, is going to help hold us to account over what we have done. Whatever we are doing on earth is being recorded and we don't know it. And Allah out of his infinite mercy, he has made us to realize 
that this is something which we can we ourselves uh, have been able to accomplish in this our age if you have a smartphone it is there in your pocket and you have an active data wherever you go is being recorded and uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the month google maps will send you a google timeline with the map of all the places that you've been to and you are unconscious that uh, you are being recorded uh, we don't see the angels we don't see the magnetic field of the earth we don't see the other creations of the earth which we do not know uh, for uh, for instance what has been accomplished years back we could not fathom that uh, a gadget a simple a gadget as small as a smartphone that you put in your pocket is able to take to make a recording of all the places that you can go and if it can do that it can also make a recording of all the things that you say so it is uh, quite clear that we have been prepared the way allah has prepared our creation is for us to be held accountable and uh, that will be done on the day of recording and we only pray to Allah wa ta'ala that Allah will give us a simple recording or even make us among those who will enter paradise without any recording, without any accountability, or without any uh, uh, question and answer, uh, uh, questioning of what we have done. As it says in a hadith, or in a famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which gives us a lot of hope in Allah, that on the day of judgment, Allah will make his slave stand in front of him and he will tell him that on such and such a day you committed such and such an action and then the slave will answer in the affirmative and he will say yes allah and he will recognize and he will admit what he has done he said i i i did, I did not disclose it to people that is nobody knew about it uh, and then the slave will admit that yes allah you did not uh, it was not disclosed then allah will say on this day i will forgive you just i did not disclose it for people and allah will let him enter paradise we just pray that will be among those uh, the the purpose is to show that this is the basis of uh, of assuming responsibility and upholding the tasks with which you are charged with in all facets of life if you are responsible to allah if you feel the sense of responsibility towards allah and the sense of being accountable to the, of, of being held accountable by allah wa ta'ala then that is what will make you uh, an, uh, a, a good human being and somebody who will always respect the charges for which uh, the the tasks with which he is charged with and for which he will be held accountable. The, uh, the other type of responsibility is the responsibility towards yourself. And this is uh, uh, very important because if you, you will not be able to be, uh, to uphold your responsibility towards others if you are not responsible towards yourself. That is why even your responsibility towards Allah, when you are in a state of mental instability, when your senses are no longer with you, you are, not, you are no longer accountable to Allah for your actions. So for you to maintain, it is very important that as part of the responsibility towards yourself, you maintain your physical and mental health and well-being. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly mentions this in the had when he visited one of uh, one of the Sahaba, Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As. He got married to a new wife and then he was uh, always uh, he was always engaged in acts of uh, praying in the night and fasting during the day so his father he visited him and he saw the wife the wife was not has not beautified herself has not put on any adornments and she's a bride there is nothing that she has done to attract her to her husband and he found it strange and he said why are you like this he said uh, my husband, he has no need for me. He is always in his prayer place. In the in the in, in the afternoon, he is always fasting. So there is no need for me to adorn myself. So his father Amr bin al-As, and you see, this is one of the strange uh, aspects of history 
the age difference between Amr ibn al As and his son Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As is only 12 years. That is, he, got, he gave birth to him when he was only 12. Uh, this is one of the strange uh, things in, the, in Islamic history. So the father went to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, this is what I have observed with my son Abdullah. So the Prophet وسلم, called Abdullah ibn Amr. He said, is it true that I have been informed uh, that you always sleep, you never sleep in the night and uh, you always fast during the day? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, don't do that. If you do that, your body is going to be extremely weakened and you are going to be extremely, you are going to eventually going to be bored and you'll drop off, uh, you'll drop out, you'll drop off everything. And he mentioned this very important statement. You have a right over yourself has a right over you. Your guest has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. So you give each and every one what is due unto him. So he mentions this, that yourself has a right over you. That is their, your child, their responsibility or over yourself. And uh, in the book of Ar-Risala, which is the famous book of uh, fiqh, which has been studied here in, in our country, in Nigeria, and wherever the Maliki Madhab is being followed, uh, in the introduction, he made a beautiful prayer. He says, A'ana lallahu ala hifdi wa da'i'ihi. May Allah help us in protecting what he has entrusted onto us. And these, what he has entrusted onto us are our faculties, the so-called seven faculties, our hearing, our sight, our speech, our intellect, our, uh, uh, our stomach, what we eat, our hands with which we hold, our legs with which we, uh, with which we walk, and uh, our uh, sexual organs. These are the trusts of Allah on us and maintaining them in a state of well-being is part of the rights of ourselves upon us. Then uh, there is the right of the society upon us, uh, which uh, has been highlighted in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, that your wife has a right over you. And he also, in another hadith, he says the, uh, the, the woman, the wife, is responsible in her household and she shall be held to account over what she has been charged with, and the, uh, which is the, uh, the welfare of his children and also protecting the home. And the man is also responsible over his household and he shall be held to account over what he has been charged with. Then responsibility towards the society. Responsibility towards the society uh, means that uh, you, you have to exist in a society and this normally under Islam, in the hadith, uh, uh, it is, uh, the society is being viewed as uh, principally made of two parts. The, uh, the al-khasa, that is the elite, which is the leadership of the society, and then the generality of the society, al amma now, this is where the civic responsibility sets in. The responsibility towards the family, uh, the responsibility towards the society. Uh, the, the, there are two, uh, in the, uh, in, in Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, in his book uh, on governance under the Sharia, that entails uh, making good the affairs of the lead, the, the one in authority, and those over whom he has authority, as siyasa to sharia fi islahi ra'i wa ra'iya. He said the book is based on two verses of the Quran, which is that uh, those in position of authority, they should fulfill the trusts which was, in, which was bestowed upon them, with, with which they were entrusted. And the second verse, which says, follow Allah, his messenger, and those in authority over you. Now, as for uh, from, uh, this is very wide, and what he has mentioned in his book, which is uh, to do with uh, governance under the Sharia, 
is indeed uh, very, very important. Alhamdulillah, the book has been translated into English. So uh, uh, participants could always have access to that book, Asiyas al Sharia of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, but for the sake of this discourse, which is just uh, for, uh, for a short time, uh, uh, the civic responsibility is uh, uh, I based uh, uh, is based upon two hadiths, which uh, I I intend to make the basis of this uh, discourse regarding civic responsibility. The first hadith is the hadith of Abu Huraira, which says, uh, which is in Sahih Muslim, Inna Allah yarda lakum thalathan wa yakrahu lakum thalathan. يَرْضَى لَكُمْ أَن تَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَأَن تَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَأَن تُنَاصِحُوا مَنْ وَاللَّهُ اللَّهُ أَمْرَكُمْ وَيَكْرَهُ لَكُمْ قِيلَ وَقَال وَكَثْرَةَ السُّؤَالِ وَإِذَاعَةَ الْمَالِ Allah loves for you, Allah is pleased with you uh, to do three things and he hates and is displeased with you to do three things. He is pleased with you to worship him and not associate partners with him or not associate any partners with him and uh, and that you hold fast onto the rope of Allah all of you and do not be divided and to offer sincere sincere uh, uh, sincere counsel to those who are in authority over you that is to offer to give nasiha to give sincere counsel. And he hates and he is displeased with you to do qila wa qal, that is hearsay, taking hearsay and then spreading uh, spreading hearsay. You know, our activities, whenever you receive, this includes whenever you receive, uh, uh, whenever you see uh, something comes to you in, the, in your phone, in your WhatsApp, your body is shaking, you just want to uh, spread it without thinking, without looking at the impact, without looking at the, uh, 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 the, 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 the repercussion of the content and so on. That is the, an example of Tila Waqal. And he also hates for you Ida at al -man. That is, uh, he also hates for you Kathrat al -sual. So uh, asking, asking so many questions and also asking people what is in their hands. Wa Ida at al -man. And uh, doing being f uh, uh, flagrant uh, destruction uh, uh, that is being spent thrift, that is uh, uh, being uh, uh, not being prudent in the way you spend uh, your wealth. Uh, now, the 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 uh, what is the uh, within the context of this discourse is the last thing which Allah has said He loves the last of the three things from us. That is unto nasihu man wallahu allahu amrakum. That you give sincere counsel to those put in authority over you. The second hadith is the hadith of Tamim al-Dari, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ad-dinun nasiha. The religion is sincere counsel. They said, to who, ya Rasulullah? He said, to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, and to the leaders of the Muslims and to the generality of the Muslims. So here also the hadith speaks of sincere counsel. The meaning of nasiha, uh, as the uh, scholars of, uh, uh, of commentaries of hadith have said, is iradatul khairi lil mansuhi lahu. The original meaning of nasiha is extracting pure honey from among all the impurities that have gathered together in the honey. When you extract the pure one, then you are doing a nusr. You are doing nusr. So the meaning of nasiha, of sincere counsel, is to look at what is best for the one that you are doing. You are giving the sincere counsel to him, and you offer that to him. You give that to him. You relate with him. You relate to him with, uh, within the context of that sincerity of motive, sincerity of will, and sincerity of counsel and advice, and sincerity of any, uh, any relationship between you and him. So it is, <clears throat> this is one of the 
uh, one of the jawami'ul kalim, the words uh, that have that are simple in uh, uh, that, that are simple in text, but have got very very wide meanings, which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been bestowed with. He said, "Lakad uti tu jawami'ul kalim." I have been given words that have got immense meanings. Uh, this, the concept of nasiha, it is what enshrines the meaning of civic responsibility under Islam. And this nasiha is to be done to the leadership of the society and to the generality of the society. Now, regarding the leadership of the society, who that is nasiha, a'immatul muslimi, Normally, the leadership of the society, what is what have been regarded as the leaders of the society are the ulama and the umara. That is the scholars uh, upon which the society is reliant on in giving them a fatwa and giving them legal judgments and in directing their affairs, uh, their social and religious and economic affairs, and also directing them with sincere counsel. This is the, the position of the ulama, which even the, those in political authorities are in need of that position. And the absence of the ulama, uh, the absence of scholars in a society, it entails doom for the society. Because as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah does not remove knowledge from the hearts of people after he has bestowed knowledge to them by uh, he does not extra he does not extract them out of the brains and the hearts of people but allah takes away knowledge in a society through the death of the ulama the death of the scholars so that when there are no more no longer any uh, authoritative scholars people will ask those who are ignorant and then those who are ignorant they will give them information based on their ignorance and they get they get uh, they go astray and they lead others astray. This is a doom of the society. So this shows the the position, the importance of this subset of the leadership of the society. The second subset is the umara, those in a position of political authority. Uh, the the ones in a position of political authority, they have a special place in the uh, in the in 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 the society because of the importance of uh, political leadership in stability whenever people come together, which is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever people come together in a group, they should make one of them the leader. Even if they are three traveling, then one of them should be the leader. So this shows because that, that is the only way to protect uh, uh, that is the only way to protect the uh, the group from uh, any harm that will afflict it, uh, afflict the group or afflict individuals of the group. And the, the only way also to achieve benefit for the whole group and for the constituent individuals of that group. So the uh, because of that, they are given a special position and a special mention. And uh, uh, the one of the important aspects of the rights of the leaders upon the uh, upon the followership is uh, uh, giving them the allegiance. That is accepting them as leaders when they have been given that authority, and not uh, uh, going out. Uh, 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 not rebelling against them and not uh, joining in anything that will uh, overthrow or bring about political instability. Even if it means that the leaders are not as upright as they should be, uh, the right of the leader is that he deserves and uh, he deserves the respect. He deserves the followership. Of the uh, of the generality of the situ of, 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 of the populace, in order to have political stability, in order to have political stability, because political stability is what will bring about uh, the achievement of all the benefits for the society. First and foremost is the religious benefits. If there is no political stability, uh, what do you uh, you will find that even the religion is the religious acts will not be able to be uh, to be implemented. 
we have, we've had in, in history of Islam, when there were so many upheavals around the Haramain, around Mecca and Medina, and there were some years during which the Hajj itself, the Hajj itself was, there was, no, there were no, there was nobody in Arafah because there was political instability and it was not possible for the pilgrims to do Hajj. And because of political instability, the Muslims took so many years, about 70 years doing Hajj without the black stone, without the Hajar al-Aswad, which they will rob, that is affixed to the corner of the Kaaba, because a certain sect, they have uh, violated the sanctity of the Haram, they have violated the sanctity of the political leadership, and they took away the black stone. So, uh, and uh, we can see that under Islam, in a state of uh, fear, and in a state of insecurity, even the prayer itself, has been the form of the prayer was changed. And we have in the books of fiqh, how to do salatul khawf, the prayer of uh, fear, the prayer in the state of fear. So it means that if there is uh, political instability, even our relationship with Allah, the normal prayers which we take for granted that we do, and, other, uh, and many other actions of ibadat, which we take for granted, they will become uh, impossible for us to practice, them, to practice them. That is why in the wisdom of Islam, and this is one of the tremendous wisdoms of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he clearly came out to say, Isma wa ati' alama wallahu allahu amrakum. You listen and obey the one that has been put in authority over you. There was a situation whereby the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, he foresaw what was going to happen in the community. There would be leaders that would be delaying the prayer till the time, the appointed time of the prayer, uh, the appointed time of the prayer was out. And they said, how are we going to pray then? Ya Rasulallah. And he said, offer the prayer in its appointed time. And then you pray, when you meet the prayer with them, you pray together with them. And we had examples of uh, some of the eminent scholars of Islam uh, who uh, we are students of the Prophet's companions. They later on became the leaders of the Tabi'in, the, the generation of the followers. They will stay in the mosque and uh, the, uh, uh, the time of prayer will be about to, to, uh, to go out, it will be about to elapse and they will sit down and they will just be pointing with their heads and doing the prayer as though they are praying. Because if they stand up to do the prayer, they will be manhandled and they will be punished. They will be imprisoned. So they tolerated that all in order to have political stability and not to open the gates of tribulations, not to open the gates of uh, 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 disturbing the public peace and uh, being an agent of instability in the polity. Uh, uh, this is not to say that uh, misdemeanors of leaders will be uh, uh, will be uh, tolerated. No, uh, to sp speaking out against what is inappropriate from leaders in a way that will not create instability and not to cre and, uh, in a way that will not create public uh, uh, upheavals, upheaval and destruction of public peace. That is clearly understood, accepted. The uh, the leaders of Banu Umayyah, uh, uh, who they were the ones who came after the generation of uh, after the leadership of the righteous caliphs, uh, the leadership of Banu Umayyah, they introduced so many things that were contrary to the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the scholars spoke against them. They spoke up. One of the things, one of the examples was that they used to, uh, they changed the order of the Eid prayer. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came to pray Eid, in, immediately he arrives at the Eid ground, he will immediately start with the, with the Eid prayer. It is only after the prayer, the Eid prayer, that he will, he will deliver his sermon. He will deliver his sermon. But the Banu Umayyah, because they used to talk for a long time, the leaders, the caliphs at that time, the, 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 the kings of the Banu Umayyah, they didn't want people to, uh, to disperse. 
and not to stay to listen to the sermon. So they change the order. They will come and start, they will come to the Eid ground, offer the sermon first, and then they will go and lead the prayer. So one time, one of the, uh, the leaders, Marwan, he came to the Eid ground and he was about to mount the pulpit. And this was also something which was not done during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't bring out the pulpit to the Eid ground, to the praying ground. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he pulled his garment and he said, no, you pray first, then you do the sermon. And Marwan said, no, this is not how uh, this has been changed. This is not how we do it. Then Abu Sa'id said, what you have changed, the one that you have changed is better for us than the one that you have introduced. So you can see that objection was there, but in a way that will not lead to disruption of the public peace or lead to uh, civil disturbance and civil upheavals. So the rights of, uh, this is uh, one of the important civic responsibilities of uh, a Muslim uh, towards the people in a position of leadership. And uh, the, uh, the other civic responsibilities that border on the life of the community, on the society, on the generality of the society, which is what was referred to in the hadith of Tamim Dari. Uh, uh, when they said, to whom shall we offer the sincere advice? He said, uh, that is the generality of the Muslims. Now, offering uh, sincere, uh, uh, sincere counsel to the generality of the Muslims, this shows the task which a Muslim is expected to undertake uh, towards uh, different facets of the society. And we can derive lessons from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who gave examples of how we are supposed to be responsible in our society, to the generality of the members of the society. The first and foremost is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did when he came to Medina by creating the social contract, the social and political contract that will hold the society together, which is normally, which is famously known as the constitution of Medina or the Mithaq al Medina. That is the the uh, 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 the, uh, the the Mithaq. That is the the declaration of uh, 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 the, the oath or the the bond that binds together the society of Medina. This was an agreement. Uh, 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 that was uh, a document that was supposed to, uh, uh, that was a kind of a declaration of uh, the creation of Medina as a society in which uh, the, uh, with the constituent elements are the Muslims who are divided among the Muhajirun, those who immigrated from Mecca, and the Ansar, the helpers, those who were originally resident in Medina. And then the different groups of the Jews who were also settled in Medina, the three principal clans of the Jews, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, and Banu Quraida. And under that uh, declaration, uh, under that declaration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he accepted that any person from among the people of Medina, be he a Jew, or be he a Muslim who commits uh, uh, a crime of manslaughter. He wrongfully uh, takes the life of another. And there is the responsibility to pay the compensation, the blood money, that it is the responsibility of the whole people of Medina to come together and contribute each and every one in order to settle that liability so this personal liability is regarded as a collective liability on the society. Even if the one who became liable and culpable is a non-Muslim, but so long as he has a social contract with the Muslims, whereby they live together, then his rights have to be upheld and he is given recognition as a civil, as a citizen 
of the entity that has been created, to which he is a part of the social and political contract. Among the, uh, the, the rights that we have been taught by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do for the society is commanding what is good and forbidding what is evil. In fact, this has been identified as the distinguishing element of the community of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where Allah wa Ta'ala said, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas, ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You are the best of communities that has come, that has been created, that has been brought forth for mankind. You command, you instruct what is good, and you forbid what is evil, and you believe in Allah. So that a, uh, and the pro, uh, and Allah wa Taala also said, uh, "Let there be from among you a community uh, that are calling towards what is good, commanding what is right, and forbidding what is evil." Now this uh, responsibility of commanding what is right and forbidding what is evil, it can be. It is as we know, it is done at three stages. For anyone that has any belief in his heart. There are three stages for which he has to do. One is to correct, is to correct uh, an act that is improper with your hand or to implement an act that is good with your hand. That is to do the, command what, the commanding what is good and forbidding what is evil with your hand. The next level, if you cannot do with your hand, for instance, you are not in a position of authority to, uh, 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 to, to close uh, 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 to close uh, 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 a certain uh, deserted area whereby uh, 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 miscreants of the society and drug pushers are terrorizing members of the society of, of the area where you are in. You are not able, you don't have the power to do that. If you are unable, then you go to the next stage, which is you correct it with your tongue. That is by speaking out, by instructing, by admonition, by taking all kinds of uh, measures through good exhortation and through good admonishment or through good advice or through uh, strong instructions. If the person uh, will only be corrected by strong and resolute instructions, anyone, anything that you do through speaking, you do it in order to check evil, then that is the second stage. The third stage, when you are not able able to do even that is to hate it in your heart. That is not to condone it because the moment you do not hate it, the moment you start condoning, condoning evil, then it will permeate in the society and nobody will raise a, an eyebrow against what is being done of evil in the society. And in the end, the evil will consume the whole society. And that is the impact of, uh, of abandoning civic responsibilities or not standing up with the true rights of civic responsibilities. Another thing which we, we can observe in the uh, life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding sincere advice to the society is what the Prophet, to the generality of the society, is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a famous hadith, Kullu ma'roof in sadaqa. Any act of goodness is an act of charity. And he gave a number of examples. And part of those examples which he gave was uh, the point that I just mentioned, the second point, which is commanding what is good and forbidding what is evil. Another example which he mentioned is you help someone who is unable to put his, uh, his luggage on his, uh, uh, to, to raise and put his luggage on, uh, on the back of his camel, on the back of his camel mount. You help somebody to do that. So the act of helping others is highly recommended and is shown as an act of charity, as an act of ma'aruf. And he said, you imatatul adha, he also, among the examples he gave, is imatatul adha anit tarid. That is uh, uh, removing something that is harmful from the road, from the way, uh, 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 from the road of the Muslims, uh, the road of the roads of the society, anything that obstructs, anything that is harmful in the road, or what blocks the drainage. Anything that will bring harm to the generality of the society, when you do, when you uh, when you remove that harm, 
it is as though you have given, you have done an act of charity. And out of this act of charity is uh, uh, coming together to help one another to, uh, to, to collectively uh, achieve a collective benefit, which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also extolled. He spoke about the Al-Ash'ariyun. Al-Ash'ariyun, they were a clan of Muslims that originally were from Yemen. And they arrived to they arrived in Medina on during the seventh year after Hijrah, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very happy with their arrival. And they had a practice which they used to do later on after they have settled, they had settled in Medina. This practice was that whenever the they observed that the provisions of some of them, the food provision for some of, of some of them is about to finish. Uh, they will assemble all, they will come together and they will say each one is to bring out what he has stored of food provision and they will gather them together, put them together in a simple, in, in, in a single, uh, in a single sheet, uh, a sheet made from the skin of, uh, of, uh, of a cow. It will be gathered together and then it will be shared equally among them. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard of this and they informed him that this is what they do, this, this was what they did, he publicly he came out and declared that the clan of Al-Ash'ari, whenever their provision is about to finish, they join, they, they bring it all together and they share it equally among themselves. They are from me and I am from them. An expression of given uh, of showing sincere appreciation to the highest level that I am one of them and they are also from me. That is, we are just like one and the same thing. So this, uh, this is an example of true community responsibility. That is, you, you are ready to know the situation of your brother, the, what, he's in his, uh, what he is in, and you are ready to share what you have with him. Uh, another thing is uh, the, the institution of zakah that has been institutionalized. Uh, the zakah is supposed to purify wealth, but the essence of zakah is to create, one of the wisdoms of the zakah is to create social mobility uh, because uh, so that people who are in the lower ramp of the ladder, they will eventually come up and become rich and be able to also pay the zakat to those who are on the on the lower level, so that the society does not become uh, a segregated society with the of the haves and the have nots, with the have nots having no hope of changing their of changing their uh, of changing their class to the class of the haves. No, but provision is been made for social mobility, and one of the tools for achieving that was the zakat. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was so serious about the zakat that he warned that anyone who refused to pay up, he said, We will take it from him together with a punishment that will take together, that will take from him half of his wealth from him as a punishment. And that was why the, the immediate uh, Khalif, who came after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq, he fought, he waged a war against those, against those who refused to pay the zakat. Zakat is an important and integral act of civil responsibility uh, to the society. And uh, uh, in secular societies where zakat is not implemented, we have very active uh, uh, communities of zakat. And alhamdulillah, here in Nigeria too, we have the, the, the association of zakat and waqf uh, organizations that, cast, uh, that cuts across all the states of the federation. And uh, they are doing very beautiful job. May Allah strengthen them. And uh, uh, in secular societies where you, the government is not participating, we have independent institutions that are dedicated to undertaking 
this uh, uh, civil action, this civil responsibility, which even though it is originally an act of ibadah, but it has got this uh, 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 civil civil dimensions. <clears throat> among <clears throat> among the, uh, uh, the there is this uh, verse of the Quran, which uh, uh, is it is as though it encaps it encapsulates the nature of our uh, of the doing of giving the the good counsel to the generality of the society, uh, the way to undertake. Uh, uh, to exercise, to observe this civil responsibility towards the generality of the society, uh, the verse is regarded as uh, a form of the commandments that uh, a, a, a form of some of the commandments that have been given to uh, the Muslims, uh, uh, because uh, the one of the uh, the things for which the Jews do celebrate is that they are, they, they, they are the recipients of the Ten Commandments. Uh, but in Islam, alhamdulillah, we are the recipients of what is higher than the Ten Commandments in Surah Al-Isra and in Surah Al-Nisa. And uh, the Mufassirun have clearly showed uh, and made a comparison of how Allah wa ta'ala gave preference uh, to this community over all previous communities regarding the commandments they received from Allah. This verse in Surah Al-Nisa, which I regard as important element of giving, of uh, showing how to offer the, how to discharge your civic responsibility towards the society is uh, uh, the verse where Allah wa ta'ala says, Wa'budullaha wa la tushriku bihi shay'a. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْجَارِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُبِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ He says, you worship Allah alone and you do not associate partners with him in worship. And you be good to your parents. You be good to your parents and your kinship uh, and uh, a neighbor that is a, kins, a kinsman and a neighbor that is that does not have kinship with you and someone who you are associated with him by his by his being near to you which is which a companion the one that is that, that keeps you a company or that you are associated by companionship uh the the wayfarer that is the traveler whose provision is uh, uh has cut off uh and those whom your right hands possess uh, these, the normal, uh, the people that you come into association with them, they fall, they, uh, they fall under this category, which have been classified by the Quran, that they are, uh, they are among, they are among those, they are the ones that principally you are supposed to give special attention in terms of goodness. And the first are your parents because goodness to them exemplifies a thankful person. The person who is uh, good to his parents, he is the example of thankfulness because somebody who is ungrateful, who is not good to his parents, he is the example par excellence of an angry, of an ingrate. And uh, this is why it is very, very important that relation, that for you to indeed become a responsible person in society, that has to be observed and that has to be seen in your relationship with your parents. Next are your neighbor, uh, next are your kinsmen, those between with whom you have uh, a relationship, a blood lineage, or uh, an association through marriage, in lawship, because the basis of relation of kinship in Islam is through blood lineage, uh, in lawship or through suckling. Uh, the woman who suckles another, she becomes his like his mother, the suckling, uh, his, she becomes like his mother, a foster, a foster mother. Uh, so all these who have, all those who have relationship of kinship to you, either through blood or through marriage or through suckling, 
you have the you have to observe special goodness to them and then uh, the neighbors and the neighbors are categorized into two the neighbors that have got a kinship to you and then the neighbors that do not have any relationship familiar relationship with you uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he categorized neighbors into three a neighbor with three rights a neighbor with two rights and a neighbor with a single right he said the neighbor with the three rights is a neighbor who is also a kinsman and who is also a muslim so he has the rights of islam by his being a, a muslim he has the rights of uh, kinship by his being a kinsman and he has the rights of neighborliness by his being a neighbor the second one with the two rights is a neighbor who is a muslim but is not a kinsman so she he has the rights of islam and he has the rights of kinship then the third is the neighbor with a single right he is the neighbor who is neither a muslim but uh, and neither uh, he, uh, neither a muslim nor a kinsman but he is also uh, but, but he has the rights of good neighbor, uh, good neighborliness even if he is not a muslim he has this right and these are the types of people you interact with in the society so uh, and then allah tabaraka wa ta'ala said uh, the orphans those who are destitute they have been given also special attention because this is the way to bring down mercy on the society the one who feels for those who are the downtrodden in the society and he feels a commitment towards them he is the one who indeed has a, a social responsibility uh, observes social responsibility and civic responsibility in the society then the wayfarer uh the the travelers uh you know the importance of taking care of travelers is so significant that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he left his uh one of the orchards that he uh, that he got uh in khaybar he said after taking the provision of food for his wives then the rest will be dedicated to taking care of wayfarers travelers that have uh, that do not have the means to uh, continue their journey or to go back to their uh, uh, places uh, so th that has been mentioned and also a sahibu bil jam the one who is uh, by your side keeping uh, who comes into association with you uh, 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 with your company uh, this includes uh, colleagues at work, colleagues at school, uh, colleagues in an activity which you undertake, uh, yeah, associates which you come together to accomplish a task or anything that brings you uh, together with a person. That is whoever comes near you, he has a right to goodness. Because it, uh, the meaning of as-sahibu bil jam, the companion that is by your side. And you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the believer as someone who is easygoing and who finds himself, who finds others also easygoing. That is people who come to him, they feel at home. And when he goes to people, he also feels at home. So this is the kind, that is even the one who is a stranger, but something brings you into association together with him, he has a right of you showing goodness to him this is also these are areas of civil responsibility and then uh those whom your right hands possess now uh, that is uh the uh, uh during the time when there was slavery the slaves and uh, uh the slaves had this beautiful position in the history of islam to the extent that they became the eminent scholars of Islam because they were given special attention. They are not downtrodden. They are not denied access to education. They are not denied access to social mobility. They were given very good education. And we have examples of slaves like Ata ibn Abi Rabah, Nafi, the freed slave of Ibn Umar. We have Aslam, the freed slave of Sayyidina Umar. Uh, we have uh, Suleiman ibn Yasar, the freed slave of Maimuna so many of them you will find that eminent scholars of islam they were all originally slaves so this shows that this verse was not just a theoretical uh decree that came from allah but it was something that has shaped the community of islam 
uh, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions and their successors. And uh, uh, these and other verses, they are the ones that hold also the key to what will shape our society uh, in, a, uh, in a way to make the, uh, that will make the society, uh, that will make us live a life of goodness in our society and achieve the collective benefit and the individual benefit for which we are always aspiring to. And uh, uh, I think I have uh, spoken for just over one hour. So I will stop here. And uh, I pray that Allah Taala will give us the blessings of this month of Ramadan, uh, especially as we are about to enter the last 10 days of Ramadan, uh, which is the, the core of Ramadan, where we are expected, where we are hoping to, uh, uh, to observe the night of power, the Laylat al-Qadr, we ask Allah to give us the tawfiq, guide us to be among those who will observe this night and uh, get uh, its benefit and its blessings. And I wish to once again thank my noble brother, uh, Mr. Fola Adiola, for convening uh, this lecture series. And I pray that it continues and it outlives all of us. And may it also be a source of inspiration for others والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته um what does one say uh, thank you very much thank you this is uh, extremely comprehensive and um, every attempt in the process to try and do a summary uh, you just ask yourself, what what are you summarizing in in such a an easy and comprehensive uh, uh, lecture? We thank you. Uh, we thank Allah for your life. We thank Allah for your discipline. Um, it's sometimes possible to have knowledge, but not the discipline of uh, putting it together to make it useful for humanity. May He continue to reward you uh, every time we have knocked on your door, uh, you have opened it. And this is another example today. Uh, by the time you are concluding, we had almost 700 people, 606 something at, at peak, and more people are still joining as I speak. But let me uh, try and get to the question and answer quickly, but before then do whatever I'm able to do about summary. Um, the lecture, fulfill its theme, which is uh, what our role is from a specific paradigm. And the our lecturer started by telling us about responsibility, uh, which in Arabic is al-masuliya. Uh, what are we charged to do? And or what we are charged to do, the tasks that are assigned to us, and then the accountability. Uh, for the, for the tasks that have been assigned to us. There are obligations, there are rights of society upon us. And we also have rights and obligations on the society. Um, and he then shared with us three major responsibilities. Responsibility to Allah and his messenger. We have been given a trust by Allah and we are accountable for that trust. On judgment day, the day of reckoning, the trust that has been placed to us to be examined. Then responsibility to ourselves, to oneself. Um, maintain your mental and physical well-being. Maintain your seven faculties. Uh, yourself has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. Your guest has a right over you. I mean, he, he, he articulated all this very, very clearly. It's better not to receive a guest than to bring in one and um, make their lives miserable. And the third responsibility leg, uh, responsibility to Allah, responsibility to yourself and to the parties that I've, I've uh, identified as responsibility to society. And the responsibility to society is in two, two forms. Um, there are those that are called the elites or leadership of society, and then the rest of us, the generality in, in, in society. 
uh, he then went into debt uh, by explaining civic responsibility. Again, using two hadiths. One by Abu Huraira, uh, uh, Allah is pleased with you doing three things. And Allah is displeased with you uh, uh, when you do these three things. The three things he's pleased with you to do is to worship him and not associate partners with him. The second one is hold uh, just um, and not divide. And the third one is offer sincere counsel. Um, Nasia, and he explained the origin of, of the word to those in authority. Uh, and then the three things he disputes with is hearsay and the spreading of it. Stop wasting your time on those things. They don't help anybody. Asking too many questions, you know, being nosy, and then being a spendthrift, not generous. You can't give, you know. Uh, in some parts of the country, they say you have a boil on your elbow, so you can't stretch. You can you can stretch your your hand. Um, those are those are three things that Allah hates. Uh, then the second hadith: the religion is uh, uh, the religion is sincere counsel. Our faith, our deen, Islam is sincere counsel. Not 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 necessarily to hurt the person to whom you are giving the counsel, but to be firm. Kind as well. Oh, okay. This is how I see it. And then you've offered your counsel. Um, uh, Allah in his book, his messenger, uh, to Allah, in his, uh, to his messenger, to the leader of Muslims and generality of the, of the public. Then he went on to describe, to define the leaders. And, 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 um, in, in, in rounding everything up, we should enjoin good and forbid evil. And he explained how we can do that. By hand, in other words, by our deeds. If we're in authority, let's change it. Let's remove the evil. Let's do something about it. If we're not able to do that because we're not in authority to do so, let us speak against it. This is not right. Not because there will be changes, but let it be known that we have spoken against it and other people have heard us. And Allah has heard us. And the third one, if we are not able to speak against it, maybe for fear of death or certain personal risk, let us resent it. Let us hate it. Um, let us not like it. And let it be known that we don't like it. And, and, and so on and so forth. Um, this cannot be justice. So what has taken him one hour and almost 10 minutes to put together. But I think that um, it's just a practice to give you a, 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 a summary. And now I will quickly, if I haven't abused your presentation <laughs> by, by uh, uh, a novice attempt at summarizing it, I would now like to move to questions and answers. Uh, Questions to be put to you and answers to be received from you. Okay. Um, any act is an act of charity, especially uh, as I'm trying to read the question by distribution of wealth beyond Parents, kinsmen. Okay, how do you reconcile the the um, how do you reconcile the pro news of overlooking the promise of overlooking sins, the last promise of overlooking sins, no account of wrong deed, when various Quranic verses have, have emphasized there will be strict accountability on the day of judgment. And the questioner uh, references Quran 99, uh, verses 7 to 8, that there, 
He stated strict accountability, everything that you have done. And yet, you are um, suggesting that there could be uh, a complete um, annulment of, 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 of sin. That's number one. Number two, can we imbibe the culture of Ichiyaya? Uh, can get this clearly among members during Ramadan for the sake of Allah. Okay. In other words, oh, okay, I think it's referring to that culture that people will bring out what they have and then we share it equally among, among people that you so eloquently dis, uh, discussed. Number three, do we accept a leader that is a tyrant or was put into power? through illegal or um, nefarious means, terrible means, won't this be against uh, commending what is good and forbidding what is evil? In other words, this leader has been imposed on us, is a terrible leader, is this, is that. Uh, why are we obeying him? Why don't we? try to change him or speak against him or hate him and, and, and so on and so forth. And last in this segment, what is the ruling for current zakat? It seems that every time we find you on the platform, people bring in questions of a zakat, but fine, that's why we have you. What is the ruling for current zakat given by some of the businessmen we see where they will put 500,000 or 2,000 inside the envelope and distribute to the people, which cannot sustain a person for a day. Looking at the reasons why zakat has been prescribed. Okay. Those okay. are the four questions in this uh, segment. Um, we await your responses. Thank you. Okay, Jazakallah Khairan, uh, Mr. Convener, thank you. Uh, the first question, uh, how do you reconcile the promise of overlooking sins and then the verse that speaks of strict accountability over all actions? Uh, uh, you see, the uh, there is uh, uh, never a contradiction between uh, uh, the verses of the Quran itself or between the Quran and the authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is very, very important that we know that. But that does not mean that we cannot uh, seek to find the, how to reconcile between the two, just as the, uh, the brother or the sister has indicated in the question, which is Jazahullah uh, Khairan, which is a very good adapt, a very good etiquette of character when talking about the Quran and the Sunnah. That is, how do you reconcile? Uh, you see, the uh, the Quran it has spoken of strict accountability. Even if it is uh, an atom's uh, weight of an action will uh, uh, will come forth with it. It will be delivered. It will be presented. But then, at the same time, also the Quran spoke about those who receive their books on the right hand, and Allah says. The one who has been uh, given his book on his right hand, he will soon be given a, an easy reckoning. Now, this is the easy reckoning which the Quran has said, which is uh, an exception to the strict reckoning. That is, there are some slaves of Allah that will receive easy reckoning. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, he, when uh, uh, she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about this, and he said that this easy reckoning is that Allah will overlook so many things. Uh, the book of action will be presented, and then uh, he will, uh, some actions will be identified, and Allah will ask him, just as I mentioned in the hadith, Allah will say, you committed such and such an action, and the slave will admit, then Allah will say, I, uh, I did not disclose it to anyone, I put my veil of uh, of, uh, of of my veil of covering over you, 
or in, in 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 the world and today i'm going to forgive you so there is no uh there is no contradiction between the two the uh the promise of overlooking is part of what the quran has said of hisaban yasira that is an easy reckoning which we ask allah to give us uh, to make us among those who will be given easy reckoning in fact there are people, as it says in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Sahih Muslim, that there are people who will be, uh, whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be asked to present them to enter paradise without punishment and without reckoning. Uh, these are all exceptions because you see there is no contradiction between the general and the exception. Uh, and both uh, uh, what has been uh, re reported as the general in the Quran, exceptions can come from the Quran and exceptions and specifics can also come from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The question of the culture of uh, sharing, Chiyaya, as he said, this is a house award, uh, convener, uh, and you also beautifully express it of bringing together it is there in most in in our in most African cultures, uh, especially those influ cultures influenced by Islam. Uh, this is the type of thing uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has blessed in the practice of the Ashariyin, which I mentioned. So it will be uh, uh, it will be good. Uh, it is a suggestion which he said that why should we not revive it? We should actually, and uh, uh, our uh, and actually in some societies. Uh, especially in the West, we see this being practiced because in the mosques, normally families come together to the mosque with the with the with the iftar with their iftar, which is the which is then being shared among all those who attend. Uh, so this is the kind of thing which is being spoken about. And uh, but in some mosques, especially uh, in, here in our country. In the most where iftar is being distributed, normally uh, there are people who sponsor it. Uh, you you hardly find people bringing food from their homes and then uh, sharing. Uh, partly because what is being distributed in some mosques uh, is uh, is uh, is brought uh, entirely by by uh, by uh, completely from other people. But it's a good practice. I agree with you. Uh, the question of accepting a tyrant leader or the one who has been appoint, appointed through nefarious means, uh, he said, it, it does not go against Amr bil Ma'aruf and Nahi Anil Munkar. Yeah, you see the uh, appointing uh, a, 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 a leader that is a tyrant is, uh, is an evil. And a leader that assumes power through illegitimate means, means is also an act of evil. It's a, it's a harmful act. It's, a, it's an act that is rejected by the Sharia. But uh, the acts that are uh, reprehensible under the Sharia, they are not at the same level. Because even though uh, uh, tolerating a tyrant leader is reprehensible, but then doing something which will lead to breakdown of peace and security of lives and property, and bring about instability and lead to tribulations and lead to a war uh, and fitna is uh, more is is is, uh, is, uh, is more serious than that. And uh, in, in the in the subject of Amr bil Ma'aruf and Nahi Anil Munkar, the standard rule is you tolerate a lesser evil in order to ward off a major evil, a, a higher, a, 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 a more serious evil. So it is regarded, there are many supporting hadith regarding this, because of time, I will not have to go and mention them. Uh, there are many hadith which has have shown that the, uh, the uh, uh, tolerating such a leader is a lesser evil than actually raising, uh, rising up in rebellion against him because the rebellion will lead to uh, bitter consequences, more serious consequences. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about leaders who will not keep up the prayer, who will deny for uh, who, who will deny our rights uh, for us, and they will demand us to be obedient to them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, "Atuhum, atuhum, haqq al ladhi alayhim wa sallallahu al ladhi lakum." Give them the rights, the the rights that are due to them over you, uh, upon you and ask your own rights 
from Allah. So this is all in order to secure the society. Uh, anyone who observes what has happened during the Arab Spring will be a very good witness to this. Look at what has become of Libya. Look at what has become of Yemen. Look at what has become of Syria. Uh, look at what has what became of Iraq. Look at Afghanistan. Look at the several years of tribulations. Uh, this is the outcome of uh, wars and political instabilities uh, that make it sometimes it is even more tolerable to have the tyrant leader. I'm sure what Iraq went through, if they were better off during the tyranny of Saddam Hussein than that what uh, than what came afterwards of several years uh, of a whole generation not knowing anything except war and uh, and disturbance and the breakdown of uh, the breakdown of all systems. Iraq used to be one of the uh, hotbeds of uh, of uh, of education in the whole Arab world. It produced so many outstanding scholars, but the whole educational system has been set back several decades back on account of this, uh, 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 the opium that was spread that you have to rise up and, get, and demand your rights. You have to check the corruption and the tyranny of leaders. All this normally, and you always have vested interest behind this kind of motion. Therefore, wisdom, uh, necessitates for us to take the lead, uh, the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also regard, uh, understand the way Amr bil Ma'roof is done. You tolerate a lesser evil in order to ward off a uh, more serious evil. You accept, uh, you go for a higher benefit and uh, leave off the lower benefit. This, uh, these are all the rules of the Sharia based on the knowledge of the maqasid, the fundament, the higher intents of the sharia. Uh, with regards to the ruling for giving zakah and the practice uh, of people giving out 500 naira, 1000 naira, 2000 naira, uh, which uh, negates the spirit of zakah, which we are supposed to, we are supposed to give what will uh, eradicate or at least uh, relieve the poverty of the poor. Uh, the poor beneficiaries. Uh, well, definitely that is not the ideal way to give out zakah. But in a situation, uh, because in fact, our scholars, especially the scholars of the Shafi'i Madhab, they say that the amount that you are supposed to give to a person as zakah should be an amount uh, that is equal to the nisab. That is, that will make him also, if he takes care of the wealth and he invests very well, and he, uh, he, he uses it in a proper way, he will be able to also give out the zakah. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, this is the spirit exp uh, exp uh, 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 espoused by some of our ulama, uh, and that is true. But then also, we have to also uh, take into consideration the permeation of poverty, whereby you have the multitude of the society, the level of poverty, getting to about 70% in the society. Uh, if you say that you are going to be quite restrictive in giving the zakah, uh, you are going to take years before the impact is felt on a large scale. But then in a situation like this, it may be, uh, uh, and this is an area where you have to, uh, where the experts, expertise of, uh, of economists is also needed. It's not just to know the Sharia, but uh, economists, they both understand the spirit of zakah and especially Islamic economists, they understand the spirit of zakah and they understand also the economic impact of giving, the economic impact of, uh, of, uh, of scarce resources that are being distributed to a higher, uh, to, to higher number of people. So maybe the distribution should be in such a way as to have a higher impact than when you relegate or uh, when you limit the distribution at a higher level, but to fewer individuals. But definitely, the practice of giving an amount that will not be able to that will only be able to buy you a single meal uh, for you and not being able even to give to the whole family, it defeats the intent of zakah. Uh, even if you want to spread it to a higher number of people, you should give something that will actually uh, relieve the pain the pain of poverty to the poor beneficiary uh these are the four questions convener <laughs> okay sorry uh, yeah i think yes i have answered before yes you've answered the four and then we have four left and um 
I think the comprehensiveness of the lecture has uh, limited the number of questions, but we'll take the four. Uh, please mention the other verse of responsibility apart from that of Surat, Surat Nisa. You, you refer to two verses, one from Nisa, the other from another chapter. This particular person would like to know which is the other verse. Number two, is it possible to have a functional council of ulamas in a secular society like ours? Uh, that's a question. Number three, what can Muslims do where they find themselves in communities that constrain them because of their low population? In other words, the Muslims have very low population in another community. How can they regain their stance? And lastly, is there any ruling or criteria for disclosing a charity that will not spoil the reward of the individual? And it makes reference to Quran chapter 2, verse 271. Is there any ruling or criteria for disclosing the charity that will not spoil the reward of the individual? Quran 2, verse 271. Those are the four questions that I have before me. Okay. Bismillah. Yes, the other yes, the other verse of responsibility. Yeah, I mentioned two verses. I didn't recite them. Uh, they are the verses mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah. They are both in Surah Tun Nisa. The first verse is Inna Allah ya'murukum an tu adul amanati ila ahliha. Wa idha hakam tum bayna nasi an tahkumu bil adl. And he said this is for the rulers. Allah has commanded you to render trust back onto back uh, to those to whom they are due and when you judge between people you judge between them uh, justly uh, and then the second verse he says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu ati'u allaha wa ati'u ar-rasul wa ulil amri minkum o you who believe obey allah and the messenger and those put in authority over you these are the two verses the first verse is uh, uh, is regarding the leaders and the second verse is regarding uh, uh, the followers uh, the, is it possible to have a functional council of ulama in a secular society? Well, quite a number of societies, they have tried to do that, uh, the, uh, especially in the West, the council of, uh, there is the council of scholars of Northern America, of North America, uh, the council, uh, uh, also the council of Muslim minorities, uh, all this, they do exist which is uh and they 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 do uh try to uh intervene uh, in matters regarding uh, muslims uh that are living in secular society so it is quite possible you have them uh you have such a council and uh, uh it is always better to have such a council independent of the secular authorities that is to be community based uh, and uh, to be uh, populated by scholars and not to be under the, uh, uh, not to be uh, constituted by, uh, by the civil authorities, uh, because especially in a situation, in, in a country that has got, especially in a country that has, uh, uh, that has uh, political parties. So when party, uh, the, the appointment, may be politically influenced and may not be entirely based on uh, qualification and, uh, and uh, ability. Uh, the situation of Muslims that are living in communities where they are a minority, yeah, we need, uh, this is uh, part of the challenge of, uh, uh, this is part of the challenge of modern time. You have Muslims, uh, they live in certain societies, uh, where they live as minorities. And this is not only in the West, even in African countries, you have such situation. Uh, and it is always good to learn from what uh, our brother Muslims, especially in the West, especially in the UK, have been able to achieve, uh, where uh, the, the, our brothers from the Indo-Pak subcontinent when they migrated at a very early time to, uh, to, to the UK, they were able to maintain their identity and they were able to uphold their rights. And also our brothers, uh, our Muslims also from the indo pak subcontinent who moved to, to uh, and part of the Arab world who moved to 
the uh, to the eastern african countries like kenya especially uh they were able to secure their rights it is good to learn from their experiences and uh there is so much material uh out there over the council of, uh, 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 th th there is actually uh, a field of jurisprudence that is being studied and is being offered and uh, fat fatwas that are based on the situation of such people in such situation are uh, being written down and uh, and promulgated and spread, uh, which is uh, what is called fiqhul aqalliyat, the jurisprudence of minorities. This was spearheaded by uh, scholars like Sheikh uh, uh, Yusuf al Qardawi, rahmatullahi Ali, and other scholars. Uh, who, uh, uh, who, co who collaborated and cooperated with him. And uh, this is something which uh, Muslims in such societies we should learn from. Then uh, the question of disclosing the charity, will that uh, 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 disclosing a charity uh, and its impact, the possible impact of obliterating or spoiling the reward uh, in the spirit of uh, the verse he mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, the verse is into the Sadaqati Fani and Mahi, wa in to Fuha, or to two Halfukara for who are Hiru Lakum, where you can fear Ankum in say Atikum, or Lahu be Mata Maluna Kabir. If you, uh, if you, uh, if you man, if you make your charity manifest, uh, and you, uh, you disclose it, uh, you, uh, uh, you make it manifest for everyone to know, Fani and Mahi, very, uh, it is indeed quite good. Were in Tukfuha, but when you uh, when you hide it and you give it to those uh, in need, uh, it is better for you. So this shows that both the uh, the hidden the hidden sadaqa, the hidden charity, and the openly declared charity, they are all recognized as good acts. The only thing is that when you are doing it in public, when you are making it open, you should take care that in your heart. You are only uh, you in you 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 the, the the motivating factor that makes you do it first should be uh, al ikhlas should be sincerity and not what you are going to get of uh, of applause or recognition from people you have to fight that but uh, be, because you see declaring charity itself and making it open it has got its own benefit because it will motivate others to do so and uh, it will also uh create a feeling of bondage between the givers and the takers and uh the rancor that is normally sometimes filled in the, that some sometimes feels fills the hearts of people that are uh that feel that they have been abandoned by those who have that is uh normally uh taken care of by making charity open i would just want to comment regarding the question of uh accepting a tyrant leader uh, uh, some people, they may say, they may understand from this that that means to be passive and not to speak against leaders. No, no, no. All it is saying is that we have to follow the rules of Amri bil Ma'aruf, that we, we are not supposed to tolerate uh, ty tyranny. But then in our intolerance to tyranny, we should not lead to ourselves into a situation of a higher and more serious tyranny. And this is wisdom, and it is very, very important that this kind of wisdom is recognized, especially by the youth, especially by the young ones. We've gone, we have been in a, in such a state, we were radicals, and uh, at that time, I remember when we were in the university, the way we used to be pacified by Sheikh Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, may Allah uh, 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 illuminate his grave. And uh, we used to feel that he was just doing uh, to, to, uh, uh, tortoise. He, was, he just wants to do everything slow, but uh, the commitment was there. He was as, uh, as uh, he was committed to not tolerating charity, but in a, in a way that is full of wisdom, which at that time we did not recognize. But now with age and with deeper knowledge, uh, I'm not saying that I'm more knowledgeable, but definitely I'm more knowledgeable than I was when I was in the university in the 80s. But, but you see, uh, we have realized that uh, that path uh, is firmly embedded in the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We should leave our opinions and submit to the uh, hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see some people, they tend to uh, instigate by saying that those hadith are fabricated hadith, despite the fact that these hadith 
they are in Bukhari and Muslim. And they even go to the extent of saying that these hadith, they were fabricated by the Bani Umayyad rulers in order to, perpetu uh, to continue perpetrating their tyranny on the generality of the Ummah. But if you, are if you undertake a study from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that have been compiled, and uh, you see how the hadith, they go against what the Banu Umayyah have been doing, you will come to the conclusion that definitely Banu Umayyah did not cause the fabrication of those hadith. And this is something which has been firmly embedded in the confirmed sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is not possible for a political leadership to change the text of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because just as the Quran was promised to be protected by Allah wa ta'ala, the sunnah by virtue of that promise is also protected. And this is what the ulama of hadith have done. Uh, sorry for that digression, but I had to do it because I know uh, from sometimes, you know, the influence, uh, uh, I, I know the, the trend uh, regarding uh, this, uh, Have we lost you? Can you hear me? No. Yeah, I okay. can hear you. Yes. I can hear you too. All right. Okay. Um, since we still have time, we'll take more. Uh, is a blood brother that is either sick or is low on funds, is, is, um, doesn't have money, uh, either for his medication or even for, for his lifestyle, is he eligible for zakat? This is your brother. Um, possibly same mother or same mother, same father. That's one, one question. Um, can zakat be given to a needy non-Muslim? Take some of these questions, you get them every year and you answer them, but as they come, I yeah. pass them over to you. Mm. Uh, the people who had them last year may not be on the platform and new people may have yeah. joined us. We are told to give zakat starting from the qualified needy closest to your to you, i.e. your relatives. What do you do when you have relatives and non-relatives calling you ceaselessly or sending you messages to remind you to include them in your zakat while the amount for your zakat is not much? What do you do when someone continuously receives zakat, but does not utilize it to make a change in this or, or her standard or, or, or life so that they can get themselves off the zakat uh, trade. Um, let me just add, since they are all on zakat, can zakat be used to feed the poor who has nothing to eat during Ramadan? Uh, can you regard what you give that person either by way of food or by way of money, zakat? Can zakat be used to provide drinkable water to a community who drinks water from the river or from the pond? Uh, can we use zakat to send someone to school? Um, can zakat be shared among multiple individuals or it has to be one person? Um, can zakat be used for the building of a mosque? Can zakat be given to a spouse, i.e. someone's wife or someone's husband, if they are in need of, of, of uh, such help? Can you give us the ruling so that we can be clear about all these things? Um, yeah, that is, that is all that we have. And I believe that, um, oh, sorry, there's a shake on the platform that's asking a, mess, uh, a question which I'll just read out to you. Um, and it's about tyrants, leaders. Maybe as you are answering this 
once I will locate the question and once I get it, I will I will okay. um, pass it to you so that we don't okay. we don't spend too much time trying to find it. Okay. Yeah, the first question regarding the blood brother being eligible for zakat if he is poor. Yes, a blood brother is eligible to be given the zakat if he is poor. Uh, the only uh, near the only relations that you are not supposed to give zakat to, even if they are pure poor, are those for to uh, who are uh, who by right you are supposed to take care of them, and these are your wife, uh, the wife she has to you have to take care of her needs and if she is needy she has to be she has her needs has to be taken care of before the card becomes obligatory upon you then you are children that are under age uh the under age children are males and females but with regards to female even those female children female children of yours that are yet to be married and taken to the houses of their husbands you have to feed, you have to take care of their needs so you can't give them the zakat. Uh, but uh, uh, the third ones are your, your parents, the father and the mother. Uh, you, can't, uh, you, you can't give them zakat because they are supposed to be uh, sufficient by your service. So if they are needy, you have to take care of their needs first before zakat will become obligatory upon you. And if by taking care of their needs, your wealth drops down below the level of nisab, then zakat is not obligatory upon you. But all other relations, you are permitted to give them zakat, including your sons. When your sons have come of age, if you have a son that is married or a son that has become independent of you, even if he is not married, he is studying or he is, uh, 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 he is, cater he is trying to cater for himself, he is struggling, you can give him from the zakat because it is no longer obligatory upon you to feed him and take care of him. The same thing regarding your daughter. If your daughter is married, but then she is under a husband who is needy and she and the husband, they are both in need, you can give her the zakat because she is no longer under your responsibility. So long as the person is not under your responsibility and he is qualified, uh, he is by virtue of, uh, and he's qualified, as a needy person, you can give him the zakat uh, uh, despite his relationship with you. Uh, zakat, uh, giving zakat to a needy, to a needy non-Muslim is permissible uh, is when the non-Muslim is one whom you hope to attract him and show to him the beauty of Islam. Uh, the Even if he is not a needy person, you can give him the zakat to show to him that Islam does not actually hate him as an individual, uh, and Islam recognizes uh, that uh, recognizes that he is also a human being that is in need of assistance. So you can give him from the zakat if it is with that intention to call him towards Islam. Uh, this is the only condition where a non-Muslim can be given the uh, the zakat. Uh, then, uh, if you have relatives and non-relatives that are both qualified to be to receive the zakat how do you do you prefer relatives over non-relatives because when you give zakat to the relatives you have a double act of goodness the act of giving the sadaqa and uh the act of uh uh, uh observing the ties of kinship and doing good to your uh, blood relations and uh, regarding those who has been uh, been receiving, benefiting from the zakat, but he has not been utilizing it efficiently to take himself out of poverty. Can you give him the zakat again? No, I think this is, uh, this is subjective. If you see that uh, uh, he has been, he is someone that uh, uh, he does not, he, he can't manage uh, his finances efficiently to make use of, uh, of what he has, then when given the zakat, just give him what will take care of his needs, his immediate needs, and don't give him what you what you feel is supposed to set him up and make him economically independent. For instance, if you know that a uh, 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 hundred thousand is going to take care of his of his rent and also buy him some food that will take him uh, a number of weeks, uh, don't don't give him five hundred thousand. Uh, if you know that you've given him 500,000 earlier and he has not been able to set up something for himself. 
Uh, so this is something which normally the, the thing is subjective and you have to observe and see where the benefit, where the individual himself will most benefit and where the zakat will most create an impact. Uh, using the zakat to give food to the poor instead of giving them the money. You see zakat of wealth is given out as well. Zakat on food crop is given out as food crop. Zakat on animals is given out as animal. So the poor, the beneficiaries to the zakat, they are entitled to the money. The only way where the only way where you can buy food for them is when you ask them that you are uh, I'm giving you as such and such amount of zakat. Are you okay that I buy food for you because the situation I see is very uh, is very tough now instead of giving you the money, especially if you know that you are afraid if you give him the money, maybe instead of buying food, you go and uh, uh, he, he, he will go and try to get married again. Uh, you may you may choose to say that give me the chance, uh, uh, give me a, give me the authority to uh, to buy for you what is uh, among the necessities of life, but with, without receiving that authority from him and that. Uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, if you give the zakat from him from using food, then it is just sadaka. Zakat is still obligatory upon you. Uh, you doing using zakat money to provide drinkable water. No, you cannot do that actually because the beneficiaries to the drinkable water may not be all poor people. Uh, maybe some people they are not poor, and they will be beneficiaries to the drinkable water. So they have benefited from the zakat when it is not supposed to be part of what they are entitled to. So you don't use the car to, uh, uh, to, to do that. And then using the card money to send someone to school, the same thing applies to using the zakat money to feed the poor. You give him zakat and you, say, you can say that this is the money you are entitled to as zakat, but uh, uh, I will pay your school fees from the zakat money. Is that acceptable to you? If he says yes, you pay. If he says no, I have a more serious commitment than the school fees, than the school fees, then you can choose to either pay for that serious commitment or give him the money, or try to convince him to accept uh, the payment of the school fees. Uh, zakat that is given, uh, given zakat to multiple individuals. Yes, this is limited to having the the actual impact. Uh, when you give it to multiple individuals, you should take care to actually give them what will at least relieve and bring uh, what will bring some relief to their uh, poverty. Using zakat to build a mosque, you no, know, the position of most of the jurists is that you can't use zakat to build mosques. Uh, contrary to what the Shafi'i scholars, they hold that you can use zakat to build a mosque. Uh, this is because what is mentioned in the verse of beneficiaries of zakat, wafi sabilillah, sabilillah, what is meant by the way of Allah is in doing jihad and taking care of the people who are doing jihad fi sabilillah. Building mosques and uh, paying for hajj fair is not part of what you will use uh, the zakat money to do. Giving the zakat to the spouse, you can give uh, a woman can give zakat to her husband. Uh, the, uh, the hadith of Ibn uh, of Ibn Masud uh, is there, where the wife she had uh, gold and she gave out she uh, she set out the she set out the zakat and she asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if she could give the zakat to Ibn Masud because uh, he had uh, little, uh, he didn't have enough. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained to her that it is permissible. And in fact, that act has got double reward, the reward of giving out sadaqah and the reward of uh, being good to a near relation. But the opposite is not permissible. The husband cannot give his zakat to his wife because the wife is supposed to be given the zakat if she is needy. And so long as the husband is rich enough to pay zakat, it means uh, his wife has to be cannot be poor to uh, to be entitled to zakat. So a husband cannot give zakat to his wife, but a wife can give zakat to her husband. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we are just just about uh, getting to noon.
it's 11.59, but I have a couple of announcements. Um, in the course of this lecture, we received the news that um, George Bola, Ajibola, passed. Uh, may it's 12 hours. Allah accepts soul. Um, and um, the Fidau is uh, taking place in Abel Kuta today at 4 p.m. for those who are able to who are able to make it. Uh, it will be a sad loss to, to the Uma. It was a very energetic member of our, of our Uma. I just thought I should let everybody know that. Uh, the second one is to, I received so many, um, okay, before I get to that, I want to say that next week, Sunday, at the same time, uh, we are having a final le uh, lecture during Ramadan, and the subject or the topic is a Muslim conception of the existence of sin. A Muslim conception of the existence of sin. And this will be delivered by none other than the 14th Emir of Kanu, uh, Muhammad Sanusi uh, the second. That is um, next week. Um, I have received a lot of uh, commendation for a guest speaker, and I know that is a humble person. I've been sitting on them, and then I felt I felt that I can't sit on them anymore. Let me just read one um, before he prays for us, and we bring the entire lecture for this week to a close. The Sheikh was able to communicate with us a very contemporary yet traditional topic on a tight rope but positive to listeners, well delivered and never offending to anyone. That was one of the so many things that was passed to me. I think it is also proper that you, you, you know that, that that's how we felt about today's lecture. Um, my last point is to thank you very much um, and thank those who came on the platform. I gave the number at peak. And even during the question and answer time, we are still in excess of 600. Um, you had prayed for me that I would be able to continue to do this. And I chuckled because when I started, the intention was not to become uh, uh, permanent. But Alhamdulillah, for as long as we have people who come, who we'll continue to make uh, uh, um, the platform available and accessible to them. Uh, there is no no fear. May Allah keep us alive. May Allah mm -hmm. continue to um, bless all of us to be able to discharge our responsibility as you have so eloquently um, uh, explained to us uh, today. And that brings us to the close. And um, we hand over the platform back to you for you to, um, to pray for us. <clears throat> Let's send our salutations to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allah, we ask Allah to bless the, to, to have mercy on the soul of our eminent brother, Bola Ajibola, and may Allah accept him among the salihin. May Allah make uh, paradise his final abode. Allah, we, we ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive our sins uh, and to make us among those who will be given uh, tawfiq to witness the Laylatul Qadr this year. We ask Allah to, ask, to accept our fast, to accept our prayer in the night, to accept our acts of charity. We ask Allah to give us good health and we ask Allah to give us peace and stability in our country. We ask Allah to guide our leaders to what is good and, the ben and for the benefit of the country and for the benefit of the citizens altogether. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم بارك لنا في هذا الشهر يا رب العالمين وجعلنا من أتقائك من النار اللهم إنا نسألك خير الدعاء وخير المسألة وخير الفلاح وخير النجاح وخير الثواب وخير العمل وخير الحياة وخير الممات ونسألك الدرجات العلا من الجنة سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين
Mabur, thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank and you. then I bring the meeting to a close. Thank you, everybody, as I look forward to welcoming you 